Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Rarely does the death of a long-retired politician prompt a genuinely worldwide reaction. But Margaret Thatcher was one of a kind. Britain's first female prime minister transformed her own country and provided the world with a model of market economics and conviction politics which was inspirational to some, repellent to others. My guest today played a key role in the creation of Thatcherism. Morris, now Lord Saatchi, was the advertising guru who helped define and sell what she stood for. How enduring is the Thatcher legacy? Lord Saatchi, Maurice Saatchi, welcome to Hard Talk. Let me begin by quoting back to you some very striking words you wrote very soon after Margaret Thatcher's death was announced. You said, everyone wants to be immortal, Mrs Thatcher is. Why? Because her values are timeless, eternal. Now those words obviously are indicative of your immense admiration for her, but do you really believe them to be true? Yes, I do, because I, I think if you were to tap on the shoulder any, any one of your audience anywhere in the world and say, uh, what did Mrs. Thatcher believe in, you'd get a straight answer in seconds. They would say something along the lines of free markets, small state, low tax, individuality, independence, self-determination. And um, I think it's a remarkable thing that um, a politician in one country can have that kind of impact globally. And, Yes, for that reason, I think it's well, an accurate description. I do love the brevity of the, the sort of five-word summation of what Thatcherism was. Mm. Is it true that in 78, 79, when you began working for the Conservative Party with their new leader, Margaret Thatcher, is it true that you were asked to put down your version of the Conservative vision on one piece of paper, one sheet of paper, and that that is what you did, what you handed to Thatcher and her team, and that pretty much became the basis of the campaign she ran? Well, it's absolutely amazing that you say that because the existence of that piece of paper, which does exist somewhere, but um, we've tried very hard to find it <laughs> in, um, in Conservative Central Office and in the Cabinet Office and in Number 10. We can't find that piece of paper. But exactly as you describe is what happened. Because it's, it's very important, is it not, in order that, that um, a precy is prepared. Because a, a precy of what you're trying to say is, um, is polite. It's a form of good manners. Some people would say that in order to try and simplify a complex um, political philosophy into a few words would be um, an insult to people. It would be treating people as morons. And I take the exact opposite view, which is that people are very busy and they don't have time. And that therefore, um, it's important to be able to, to Make a capture pricey. the idea in as simple a yes. form as possible. I can see that as an ad man, which you were and are, that, that that is absolutely what you are about. But I'm fascinated by the idea that you came to this as something of a political agnostic. I mean, is that true? You weren't a diehard Tory when you first came upon Maggie Thatcher and upon you know your role in the Conservative no, Party. No, should I describe how would that be? Would people be interested in how that actually happened? I don't think I've ever described it before. Go on. I'm quite happy to. Well, briefly, um, I'd love to hear it. Sure. Um, this would have been in 1978. Um, Mrs. Thatcher had already set up the Centre for Policy Studies in order to develop her, her thinking, of which I'm happy to say I'm now the chairman. But um, the, the object of the exercise, at, as she saw it at the time, was that a group of volunteers would work to try and s see her elected as Prime Minister in 1979. Um, that wasn't the view that we took. Our advice was that this wasn't the thing to do, to have volunteers. The thing to do was to have a, uh, a firm relationship with one company, which would stand or fall with her. And um, after a lot of deliberation, that's exactly what they decided to do. And of course, it then it has become a historic relationship. Yeah, and Saatchi and Saatchi connection with Thatcher, which li lived through three election victories. Yeah, but sure. but But uh, part of the message and part of the idea that you continue to, to peddle about Thatcherism was that there was something deeply moral about making money, about delivering 
wealth to individuals. And so, I think that is an idea which, particularly now, you know, after the financial crash, after the malfunctioning on, of free market capitalism in such mm. a big way, looks more threadbare. Well, I mean, you come, you come straight to probably the most important, most important point of all in terms of political philosophy, which is what, what, is, the, what is the reason um, for Mrs. Thatcher's interest in um, money? Why, why would that be? Or let, let's. I don't mind calling it money. In, she believed in the, in the goodness. No, we're going. Of money, well, let, let's know? discuss that exactly because I think that's absolutely the fundamental point, Stephen. Um, her, in her mind, there would be a clear connection between the most fundamental value of conservatism, which would be freedom and money. This is most important. The reason she would say that is because she followed the view of Professor Galbraith, who, who memorably said, that the, the greatest restriction on the liberty of the citizen is a complete absence of money. And it, therefore, can she I just quote back to you something else that Galbraith said? Sure. He also said, the modern conservative is engaged in one of the oldest exercises in moral philosophy. That is, the search for a superior moral justification for selfishness. Well, I mean, again, this is a, this is a very key point. The, pe the reason why people have, have become distressed about free markets lately is that, of course, they can see that it, it can lead to greed and that the unpleasant consequences in terms of the gap between rich and poor and everything else that we've just seen. So there, uh, there's absolutely no doubt that you're right, that there is a question mark over free market capitalism which hasn't existed before. Um, but Mrs. Thatcher herself would understand that completely. She would, she would see the, the merit of a free market in this way. It was best described by, in a sense that she would follow completely, by Professor Lionel Robbins at LSC. He, he said that the, the merit of a free market lay in competition. And he described it very simply. Every day, thousands of people cast their votes for the hundreds of products and services on offer. And from the competition to win their votes, better and better products and services emerge. That is the essence of what she believed in. So the concept, as you well know, is that individuals pursuing their own self-interest, their rational self-interest, will in the end bring about the best outcome for all. But, but she then, certainly believed that completely. Second, what, what, and I know you've stayed in, in touch with her throughout her, her long life until very recently. I just wonder what you believe she made of the terrible dysfunction within capitalism of the last few years when we've seen you know, the banks behave in outrageous fashion, take absurd risks. We've seen mm. everything from sovereign governments to I individual financial corporations take on unmanageable levels of debt irresponsibly. Mm. And we've seen you know, pay take off in a way that suggests that corporate executives cared much more about short-termism and personal gain than they did about long-term sustainable growth. What would she have made of all of that? Would she have seen that perhaps some of her ideas sowed the seeds of that? I can tell you, I can answer that completely because I asked her. And she said? I put it this way. Do you know, Margaret, what is the share of the top five banks in the UK in all financial transactions? Mortgages, loans, insurance, overdrafts, credit cards, everything. She said she didn't. I said, this was only a, a year ago. I said, um, it's 80%. She said, with eyes blazing, it's impossible. I said, it isn't. It's a fact. Now, the thing is, Stephen, when she was saying it's impossible, she wasn't saying it's not true. She was saying, it's intolerable. So she would have used government, would she, to have regulated well, we, that problem we, out of existence? We, even can, all, though we can all see that the, 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 the merit that is in her mind and in the, in the minds of all proponents of free markets, it, the root of the merit that they see is competition. If competition, in the way that I described the formula, people competing for votes will naturally, in their own interest, produce a better product or a better service. If that formula stops working, because there is no competition, because what's emerged is global cartels, then 
the system isn't generating what people like Margaret would believe it should do, which is competition to bring better services for all. People acting in their own interest. If that, if that formula has broken down mm. as a result of the effect of globalization, the creation of giant global cartels, that's a real problem. And her blazing eyes were um, uh, a very important indicator to me that if she was observing that scene now, she would be completely understanding that this is an unacceptable version of um, her understanding of the merit of free markets. I just wonder if she would have taken on the banks and the financial sector in the way she took on the unions. Um, that's, uh, that's impossible to know. If her blazing eyes on the discovery that five banks control 80% of, five companies control 80% of a market, if her blazing eyes are anything to go by, which they are, she would see completely clearly that this is totally unacceptable and will not bring the result that she would like competition to produce, which is the best for everyone. Ian McEwan, the novelist, um, wrote uh, after her death of how critics had a problem with her because they felt that she exhibited a striking lack of compassion, a lack of heart, and that in the end she had monetized, to use his phrase, monetized mm. human value. Do you understand where Ian McEwan's coming from? Not particularly. The, although, of course, I follow that people do, I follow that people do say that. Let's consider it. In terms of divisive, so here you have a woman who most of the people watching this program will think of as a heroic figure. Probably the people around the world who um, may have observed that some people in England, for reasons they'll probably find quite hard to understand, don't see her in that way, like the quote that you just gave. That's, I think, going to puzzle your international readers. And the only explanation I can give for the fact that some people regard her as in the way you described is that Anyone who um, stands for something is going to have people for them and people against them. If you stand for nothing, you'll have nobody for you and nobody against you. So here is a woman who clearly stood for something. I described it right at the, right at the beginning. So it's clear that some people would not necessarily agree with what she stood for. But the, and that's, of course, something that she would have to accept and did. Sure, but three, three and a half million people unemployed during uh, the 1980s, entire regions economically decimated because of the closure of the mines, of the steelworks, of a whole raft of, of industries which had been mm. productive and created tens of thousands of jobs for so long. She didn't seem to care that much about the losers. Well, I can describe what she did care about, which she, she would um, undoubtedly believe, as I would, would in the end bring the best outcome for all. Her, perhaps for your, for your audience, the best thing to do is to, is to judge her. When they hear comments like that about her, how, how is your audience to decide? Is this woman a, a truly heroic, iconic figure, as most people in Britain believe? Or are those voices correct? A, a good suggestion, if I may, for how they could consider her position, is to weigh her up in the way by, by the ultimate test, which we have, which is what would happen in a, in a, with a jury in a court of law. After all, people do talk about the jury of public opinion, do they not? So let's, let's consider what this... Sorry, go on. Well, no, I, I, it's an interesting idea, but I, I suppose what I'm, what I'm thinking is that Nobody really now disputes that Britain in 1979 and through the 80s needed transformation and she delivered transformation But she did it in a particular way and I've talked about the the sense in which her critics see divisiveness there inbuilt into her approach I just look at a, an example. Let's take Germany for example, which through the 80s and 90s has had to make its own Transformation to to introduce new competitive practices to modernize industry to get rid of old inefficient industry And it's done it in a very different way a consensual way in which government employers and employees despite their differences have tried and succeeded in working to get together to deliver a new Germany and that never seemed to be an ambition that Thatcher and Thatcherism had. Uh, I'll describe her. I'll describe her ambition, and um, in the context of that motive, going back to the jury, 
the jury would be asked by law to consider the key question of what is the motive of this person? What was the motive? What was she trying to do? What was, she, what was in her head? What was in her head as her motive is very simple because I, I'm not revealing any secret. She expressed it very simply and straightforwardly thousands of times, which was, Britain can be great again. That was her driving, driving motive without any doubt at all. And that, that determination that Britain would recover its place in the world, its proper place as she saw it, was the guiding inspiration for all that she did. Now, her method of achieving that was to say that she understood how to bring about economic success for Britain. And I describe what it was. And she would apply those principles and those beliefs and she would make uh, the outcome better for everyone. This is this is. Well, you say better for everyone, but she she frankly, you know, here's a quote from her after the Falklands victory when she hailed the victory over the enemy without. But she said, "We must beware the enemy within." She used that phrase, "the enemy within," which is much more difficult. She said to fight and dangerous to our liberty. It, it, that was the, the the sort of either you're with me or you are an enemy mentality. Uh -huh. The, but the thing, the thing to remember about her is that Margaret Thatcher is, a, is a, an anti-establishment figure. That's why it's ironic that people now, of course, see her, in, see her as a, a protector of the establishment. That's not at all what she thought she was doing, or did. She thought that the reason that Britain was in a, a poor state and was described, remember, Stephen, as the sick man of Europe, and her, her understanding was that it was her role her historic role to rescue Britain from the position of sick man of Europe. But Lord Sutton, what I'm trying to get to is, is how she did it. No, no, no question, there was a need to, to transform, and she delivered transformation. But that the means is is of great interest. And, and again, one more quote from the past, which has become so so very famous, was the was the the woman's own interview when she said, you know, who is society? There is no such thing. There's just individual men and women and their families. No government can do anything except through people. People look to themselves first. Well, that's, that's absolutely correct. It's an anti-collective notion, pure individualism. And I just wonder whether, again, today, with everything we know about the way the world works today, whether that is quite as timeless and eternal as you insist it is. Well, in individualism in the sense of liberty must be timeless and eternal. And the best example that I can give you is that the iconic policy that followed from the philosophy that I described, which had the individual at the heart of it, was the, which reflected that philosophy, was the sale of council houses to their tenants, which probably that one policy is the explanation for three conservative election victories in a row. What, where did that policy come from? It didn't emerge from nowhere, as um, it is popularly now thought happens, that politicians would conduct research, find out what people want, and then make a list of the policies that would suit what people appear to want. That, that's not what happened. That's a reverse process to the way that Mrs. Thatcher thought. Her view was that I, ha I have my faith in individuals. What can I do to make individuals more powerful, more independent, less dependent? If they own their own home, they will be king of the castle. They probably will mow the lawn. They probably will cut the hedge because they'll feel like king of the castle. And that's what she wanted people to be. If they, they could be the king of the castle, they could be their own boss, they could have power. They would not be dependent on anyone. Not their boss, not the state, nobody. They would have yes. power themselves. You see. I do see. I mean, you could, I, see, I, why, you I, could I, see why I, this would be not only very see, attractive, I, but also completely timeless. And I see the connection between that fairly simple set of powerful ideas and, and, and the appeal it had to you as an ad man to go out and sell it. And I do want, before we end, and we don't have so much time left, I just want to bring it to quite a personal point. You know, you work with her closely and you got to know her very, very well and you, you, you remained friends with her. Um, one thing we haven't talked about is her gender. But the historian Dominic Sandbrook wrote the other day, he said, actually, you know, for all of the ideology, the power of the idea that came with Thatcher, what may be most lasting about her is the fact that she was the first woman prime minister in the United Kingdom. You worked with her from the beginning when she was a relatively unknown cabinet minister sure. turned opposition leader who then ran for the top job. 
you tried to change her to a certain extent, and I wonder why you did that. We didn't. There, there are, there, this is one of the great myths of, of history. Firstly, Stephen, our, our role in Mrs. Thatcher's election victories is colossally uh, exaggerated. She, she believed, as she taught me, that general elections are intellectual battles in which the winner is the one with the best arguments mm. and you put them forward very simply, here's, which she did. Here's something Henry Kissinger said upon news of her death. He said, you know, she had something very special. She had a clear vision of the future, which she laid out before the public. And he said she did not fall into the trap of searching for the middle ground before the public even knew what she really stood for. He's 100% right. So, um, but, but what, what I, I want to I actually have you reflect before we finish on post-Thatcher politics and mm. post-Thatcher leaders. Mm. Is, is that capacity she had to lay out a vision knowing it was actually, frankly, for many people unpopular, but being absolutely determined to pursue it anyway, is that something which today's 21st century politicians simply don't have? Well, this, this would be a very good point to, to end on. The, Henry Kissinger is right in the sense that her view would be that if I, the, the, the centre ground... But if the centre ground's over there and I'm here, what's going to happen is I'm going to move the centre ground from there to where I'm standing. That would be her approach. Another approach would be if the centre ground's over there, i better walk over there. So in answer to your question of where, where does that leave um, this whole generation of Because now politicians. politics is all about the centre ground. You know, in, in the United Kingdom, we have David Cameron, yes. Ed Miliband, Nick Clegg. They're all battling to be defined as the most appealing to the centre ground. But everyone now says that. It's become conventional wisdom. In fact, you probably hear every two days that the only way to win an election is to appeal to the centre ground. That wasn't her view, as I explained. If the centre ground's over there, I'll bring it over here to me. And, which of course you need she, a very special sort of mind and leadership capacity to be, to be utterly confident you can do that. Sure, well, we are talking about somebody with a very special mind and leadership quality, are we not? And that was, that was her view. Let, in let's terms end, of... Go on, sorry. I want to end, we were almost out of time. I just yeah. want to end with this quote because it seems to me so striking. Hugo Young, a very respected political commentator who actually died in 03, but before he died, he wrote this about Thatcher. He said, her greatest virtue was how little she cared if people liked her. She needed followers as long as they were prepared to go in her often unpopular direction. And the Saatchi campaigns, he said, were never about getting her liked, respected, but not liked. Is that a fair summation? That's another excellent quote, and he's completely right. Um, I, I have been accused lately by, um, you know, Professor your audience when Professor David Butler, who's written all the books on all the British general elections, he said that we had, he, talking to me and uh, talking about me and Mrs. Thatcher, we had reduced all British general elections to negative campaigning. In other words, to pointing out the defects in the opponent's position rather than putting forward our own position. And he said that's transformed in a bad way, he was saying, all politics and all political campaigns which have now become entirely negative. But um, to, to his point, it's, it's, it, I don't think it's that she didn't care what people thought and she wasn't trying to make herself liked. I don't know, um, I, she never talked in those terms. But she would be absolutely certain, going back to what I said about being, having the best arguments, that if somebody over here is going to present another argument which you think is completely wrong, it's your duty to point out what are the defects in your opponent's position. And she did that, we did that, in my opinion, magnificently. Morris Saatchi, <laughs> we have to end there. Thank you very much indeed for being on Hard Talk. My pleasure. Thank you very much indeed.